If you want to add real-time features to your ASP.NET Core applications, or even add some real-time to your .NET Core microservices, you should definitely check out ASP.NET Core SignalR, which allows us to create real-time applications um, in no time at all. So I have Brady here, my good friend, and he's going to talk about some of the really cool features that are coming up in the next version, and even in the current version of ASP.NET Core SignalR. Welcome to another episode of the On.Net Show. My name is Cecil Phillip, and I'm your host today. And with us, I have probably one of my most favorite people at Microsoft. We have Brady Gaster joining us today. Hey. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. It's nice to see you again, as, as always. So I know, it, you know it's, it's a little crazy outside with the weather, and I know you took a little bit of a, you know, made a lot of effort to be here. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. That's okay. That's okay. I actually made a video. So if anybody wants to see what I had to brave to get here. You have a video? I have a video. Can I, can I see it? Like, we can totally see it. So okay. I live in a place called Sammamish, which is on a plateau. Okay. And it's up way high. Okay. So there's no really safe way to get here. Right. This road might be one of the least safe ways to get here. Um, I actually cut it off about halfway down because there was a wreck. And I didn't want the people to like be on camera that they were in a wreck. How did you take um, this video? Well, I position I have a Wrangler, so I'm not afraid to go anywhere. Okay. So I position my camera up on the dashboard. I've got one of those little things that spins around. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have it basically on the dashboard and I kind of tilted it so we could see up and just hit record. Oh, cool. So, so you weren't like holding your camera like no, when you were driving? No, I Because we don't do that, right? We don't, that's we, that's we, good. We don't do that, nor, nor do we talk. So, uh, <laughs> right, right. But, but, but you can see uh, it's, it's uh, pretty snowy outside. And once you get down to where the lake is, we were actually following a snowplow. Yeah, so you see that? Like, that's crazy to me. Like, I'm from Florida and it doesn't, we don't get weather like that, so yeah. I'd probably die like if I had to go like no, deal right. with this on a daily basis. That's why you need a Jeep. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, that's that's okay. an awesome video, though. It's fun, yeah. So we'll go out later and go snow plowing in the Jeep. If you we can we can talk about it. Good, yeah. Since you're from Florida, it's probably a random thing for you. Probably. Yeah, we've never done that before, so <laughs> we could we could talk about it. We can it. do this. Look out on the roads later. Okay. So so you're here to talk to us today about Signal R. Absolutely. Right, so, so for some of the folks that might be watching that maybe they don't know what it is, why don't we do like a quick one-on-one? -on -one? Like what is SignalR? What do we do with it? So what are some have, of the use cases? So I have a deck here. I'm going to go ahead and run. And I know our, our, our good buddy Robert Green never likes to show decks on uh, Channel 9, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. So what SignalR is, you probably heard of WebSockets. Uh, you probably also probably heard of server sent events or uh, any of the other real-time-ish technologies yeah. like long polling, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So the way I like to talk about it is if you think back to, you know, talking to one of your project managers and he said, well, people don't really want to have to refresh. They right. just want to see when the data is updated. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Like, so you start thinking polling or sure. iterating over. So the nice thing about SignalR is it's an abstraction. And we knew that WebSockets wasn't going to be the last end-all be-all like thing for real-time HTTP. There's probably going to be something that comes after that. Yeah. So what we do is we write an abstraction and I'll kind of show you how it works in a simple little animation. So with old school clients and servers, uh, aka those which don't support WebSockets or have it turned off, uh, basically it works like this. You know, you have a long polling scene. Okay. Like the, the client says, do you have data? Do you have data? Do you have data? Sure. And finally the server says, yep, I've got some data. Yep. And then what happens? We start polling again. Do you have data? Do you have data? Do you have data? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how SignalR works under the covers if WebSockets or service and events aren't there. Okay. Now, in the case where they are there, we have this thing called negotiation in SignalR where you actually, uh, the, the client reaches out and says, what can you do for me? The services, I support WebSockets, and then you can party on it. So effectively, it's kind of what the conversation looks like when you're talking about modern browsers. Uh, basically, both sides say, I do real time to you. I totally do real time. All right, let's party in real time. Sure. So, so now it's like we a have handshake, a, right? It's we like just a handshake. agree on what we're, we're exactly. going to use, and then we use exactly. that throughout the, the lifetime of the Exactly. And, and in SignalR speak, we like to call that, or in the team room, we like to call that process negotiation. Got so it. it's like the client is basically reaching out and saying, what can you do? Like, okay. can you do WebSockets? If so, that's what we're going to do here. Got it. I think it helps best to kind of start with a demo. You got a demo? Let's, let's take I, got, a I got so many demos, it'll make your head spin. <laughs> All right, so what we have here is a demo that I did at uh, IglooConf in Finland recently. I'm using 3JS here on the client. And you'll see that I have like a spinning, it almost looks like the Superman 2 prison, you know, where they're trapped in the. I'm showing my age again, I'm sorry. That's kind of so, cool though. Is this all happening in the browser? It's all happening in the browser. So this is totally happening in the browser. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up an, another browser, which you'll see right here. And you'll see this URL is going to three time, or excuse me, realtime 3 dwebazurewebsitesnet Okay. And then if I take this guy and shrink him up a little bit here, 
you'll see that he's going to the same place with WAC control. The idea behind this is this is the XYZ control, and I can actually can control any of the axes on this guy just by using one of these. Oh, I like So that. I can actually change things up right here, and I can go like this. But, you know, that's kind of cool. The nice thing is, like, you could actually pull it up in your web browser, uh, and you could actually use those sliders here. We'll have another real-time thing here in a minute across, across nice. demos. But to show you what else you can do with that, I actually pull up my mobile phone here, and on my mobile phone, I've got an app that's also listening to the same SignalR hub, yeah. which we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay. Uh, and the idea behind, the, but behind this is it's going to actually tap into my gyroscope on my phone in my uh, browser. And if I hit re Reset Center, see if it'll refresh here, and then refresh this guy. And now I can actually oh, can see here. Oh, nice. So you see as I move my phone, we're actually rotating that panel in real time. That's very cool. Isn't that neat? So is that is that a web app or is that like a mobile totally Xamarin right. app? This is this is not a Xamarin app. This is not a Xamarin app, not a native iOS app. This is just a mobile web browser. Nice. I so like that. yeah, it's uh, it's all out there on public. Um, I'll put, put a link up later. For yeah, we'll put the links in the show yeah. notes so everybody so, can check it out. Right. So this is the idea behind SignalR. And one thing that you saw is when I had that uh, when I had the thing up with the sliders. The, the idea behind the sliders is uh, like I can control X and yep. you can control Y, but if I'm controlling X, mm -hmm. you actually can't control X until I let go. Got it. So it's kind of a mouse down, mouse up thing. Uh, the idea behind that is we have this thing in SignalR called a hub. A hub literally lives on the server side, and it, it is pretty much what it sounds like. You've got all the spokes, all the clients, and then the hub kind of lives in the center. And what you saw earlier is that you know we use the clients.all. And then clients.all, a client will actually send a message into that hub, and then I'm going to say clients.all.do work or you know, invoke a method on the hub, and that goes to all the connected clients. At the same time, with SignalR, you can actually target an individual client. So in this case, you'll see that I've said, you know, like Damien sent a message in, sure. and we did clients.caller. That's only going to call back to him because he's the caller of that particular method. So in SignalR, right. we have the concept of invoking, mm -hmm. and then we also have the concept of being able to push an event back out to the client. Got it. Got it. Um, so if I get out of my deck here, because I know we rather look at code. Sure, let's um, take a look at some code. If I flip into my code real quick, you'll see that I have, if I can go into the right, pardon me, I might not have the right guy open here. Let me back out, pardon, uh, CD igloo conf, uh, and then CD real time web. Sorry about that. No, no worries. One. And I'm in dark mode, I apologize. So you're pulling this up now in Visual Studio Code. I'm, I'm using Visual Studio Code. Right, um, so that means that you're running it on, I'm guessing you're running it on a Mac, mm -hmm. right? So that means that SignalR is running on a Mac. So exactly. And that's because we're running on .NET Core. Right? Exactly. It's cross-platform. Exactly. We can run it on Linux, Mac machines, Windows machines. Exactly. Exactly. You could actually use, as we'll talk about here in a minute, um, if you wanted to use SignalR inside of the plumbing, let's say of your microservices running inside of Kubernetes, yeah. you can actually call a SignalR hub running on a server, or as we'll talk about in a minute in Azure, mm -hmm. uh, from a background service. So you can actually oh. call it from a background service running in .NET Core. Cool. Okay. So like we talked about earlier, we talked about the server-side hub. I'm just going to show you one quick hub. So I've got this rotation hub here up on my screen. Yeah. And what you'll see is that I've got uh, a method here called lock access another one called unlock access, and this is actually the client making a call into my hub. Got it. So this is what we would call like an, an invocation. Like I'm going to yeah. actually, it's almost like a rest call. Like I'm actually sure. calling my hub from the client to the server. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the normal, you know, the way things work. Right, sure. When you talk about ACTP. Now where things get a little interesting is when we start to talk about things like clients.others, or as I showed in the slides earlier, clients.all, or clients.user, and I can actually target a username. So here I could say Cecil if I wanted to. Um, and I could send something over there if I want to. Now, this is like my C-sharp code, my .NET Core code, like I said, running on my server side, right. uh, or in my case, uh, running on my Mac. Right. So we have the ability to not only send events from the client to the server, and then the server runs some code, but then we could go the other way. Because we could have something would happen on the server and send that information. That's back. exactly right. That's exactly right. And the way that works is that chart you saw earlier, mm -hmm. uh, when we were talking about long polling and, and whatnot. Effectively, right. like let's just take the long polling out of the equation, take the server send events right. out of the equation. Let's just talk about it in terms of WebSockets. Mm -hmm. uh, my client is real time connected to my server. Yeah. Whenever something happens, it just knows to send a message over that WebSocket back to the uh, back to the client back again. To the and then the client would literally handle it, if I were to look right here, realtime.js, and our client, we would instantiate an instance of our hub connection, and in this case, actually give it a URL. You wire that URL up in your startup CS file. Um, it's basically like routing an MVC controller. And then if I scroll down below, you'll see connection.on. That's literally whenever the server 
is going to send me the control locked event. Actually, get rid of this, and I will split my screen here. So if I were to close this, you'll see here that we've got connection.on, and yeah. look at my file type, JavaScript. In my client-side JavaScript, I'm going to listen for the control locked event that's going to come from my server whenever the clients.send query sync method is called. Nice. So like you said earlier, I could actually have a REST API that I'm sending data into my SignalR hub or into the server, and then yeah. I could literally turn around and then push back out. You know, so if you think about SignalR's, I hate to say yeah. it, but think of SignalR's pushing from the server to the client. Got it. So it's a it. really strong use case for it. Right. So like so. these on methods that are here in JavaScript, essentially, I'm, I'm supplying it the string, but that string is just like the name of the event that I'm listening to. Correct. Right. It's nothing special. It's just the name of a string, and then I'm guessing on that pipeline. Exactly. You know, we're looking at the messages that are going back and forth. Exactly. We're saying, okay, well, if this is the thing that's coming now, right. This is the this is the method, or this is the path that I want you to execute. Exactly. And and if you think about this as like a higher level abstraction, like I've done a little bit of coding directly against a web socket, um, actually right over here with uh, Jeff Fritz a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're building uh, an SDK for the Elgato Stream Deck right. in .NET Core. Um, that that little bitty device actually mm -hmm. runs a WebSocket server. Really? Um, okay. But they they hand out a protocol, mm -hmm. which SignalR actually has a protocol spec as well. So mm -hmm. we and when we did the SignalR Core, we actually rewrote it from the ground up, and we created a hub specification and the I, or a hub hub protocol specification. The idea behind that is if you wanted to write a client in SignalR for Go yeah. or Python or whatever else, you could do that using that that specification. Nice. And you don't really care about what's happening on the server side or if it's written in .NET. All you care about is if we send you a one, you serialize it this way, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And I know um, like SignalR is open source, right? So I'm guessing that correct. protocol is documented in open source too, it is so indeed. I can go online. And totally. If I wanted to do my own, exactly. like I could go and check that Exactly. Out. And that's exactly why we did that, that. That hub specification, I could give you the link, so it'll be in the show notes down below. Yeah. But if you want to build your own client, you could definitely look at that. That's the best place to get started. Cool. That's um, awesome. So yeah. Uh, but what we ended up doing was we, we used the Elgato uh, Stream Deck WebSocket API. And if you think about that's you know WebSocket is really just a connection. Yeah. It's the protocol that's important. So they have a different right. protocol than we have. So you can't just put SignalR on top of a WebSocket. But having programmed directly against a WebSocket, trust me, SignalR is a lot easier because you've got nice. like the higher order, you know, APIs. Right. So right. Um, uh, one thing I'd mentioned earlier, I flip over here. You'll see if I do a quick refresh on this. Now you'll see here that I've got. Um, let me zoom in. I'm just opening up my, uh, my browser tools. Yeah. We'll see here that it says SSE connected. So okay. that's actually this guy is connected uh, over SSE to my Azure website. Now, if I were to go into my app here. And SSC, when we say SSC, that's service, service and events. events. Exactly, right. service and events. So if I were to go into my app service uh, uh, panel here, or blade in the portal, and you can see that I've got this little checkbox right here, WebSockets. Can literally go here and just turn that on, yeah. and then I'll save it. And it usually takes just a second, and the app will spin back up. Now let me do a refresh here. That's probably going to die for a second while it spins back up. So um, we're guessing now, now that you turn that on, we're going to have WebSocket support available inside of our Azure App Service. And yep. All we have to do is like flick that button, right? Exactly. And now it's going to be running. Exactly. And now okay. it's going to be running. And now if I were to zoom in here. See that all I did was change that one thing in the portal, and now we're actually running WebSockets. Nice. So okay. that shows you how, without having to do any coding, mm. you change your underlying protocol, and SignalR just knows what to do. Right. It just does that negotiation handshake, and now it knows party on WebSockets instead. Right. So, so it just checks it. It gets like the best, the best available version, or, yes. or the best available protocol. Like exactly. Or, or not protocol. Careful. I'm sorry. Because it's the hub protocol. You're it's right. always the hub protocol. You're right. It gets the uh, the most. Uh, it gets the most efficient um, transport. Transport. Thank there you. we go. Thank you. Got it. What nice. Name? I, I tried to I tried to be know it all and I forgot the word. <laughs> so, um, but the good thing is is you don't have to stop you know with an HTML client. You could actually do things in background services. Here's a doc that we recently put out. Okay. Um, actually, just put this out yesterday. Nice. Um, and if you were to go to the ASP.NET Core section in Docs and then go down to Real Time Apps, you'll see under the Hosting and Scaling area we have this SignalR with background services. Right. Right here. The idea behind this is. Let's say you have a couple of different background services in .NET Core that are doing things on the server side. Mm -hmm. um, you name it. It could be a million different things. Yeah. Um, you might need to use SignalR to just kind of report how the process is going. Like okay. you might have a microservice that you know takes the order and a microservice that checks the balance and all this. Yeah. And if you wanted to have some sort of a dashboard to watch the traffic flow, you could do that. Sure. And in this doc, we actually show you, we've got a pretty simple example of server-side clock. 
In this doc, we actually show you how you would use a background service to host a hub. Yeah. And we also show you how you would use a background service to respond to events on a hub. Got so it. you kind of see it on you know, either end of the equation there. So, so, so let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So for this particular use case, mm -hmm. what would be the benefit of me running SignalR through this background service versus mm -hmm. just me having it in my app regularly? Um, the, not necessarily any benefit, but I would, I would back you up there and I would ask you, like, what does it mean to be an app versus a background service? In .NET Core, I can have sure. an ASP.NET Core Razor app mm -hmm. that is a pretty dumb terminal that mm -hmm. just reports data because it's got a number of background services that I wire up in the DI layer That's that do all my work on the backside. Right. So I could put my hub in there if I want to. It's, you know, it's not always the place people would put things. Sure, uh, sure, sure. To give you an idea, I have an app right now uh, that I'm working on. It's kind of a dashboard app that... It kind of does exactly that. It, it's creating a bunch of uh, resources in Azure and then deleting those resources in Azure. Yeah. And that all happens in a Azure DevOps build. Yeah. Um, I'm actually using the next topic we're going to talk about, which is the Azure SignalR service. Mm -hmm. And the Azure SignalR service has a REST API front end. Yeah. And I can actually use that. Let's say I have a client like a, a small device, yeah. uh, IoT device of some sort, and mm -hmm. it might not have WebSocket support, but it has the ability to ping an HTTP endpoint. Yeah. I could actually expose a SignalR service endpoint of a REST, and it would just send, it would send me a message that literally says, I want you to do the, the, the say hello message, and here's the payload I want you to send. Yeah. And it will then turn around, the SignalR service will turn around and then send that message to all of the connected clients. Got it. So okay. um, when we talk about the Azure SignalR service, We've also got a doc in that same hosting area here, uh, and our good our good friend Anthony Chu mm -hmm. has done quite a bit with the Azure SignalR service. Sure. Uh, what's it used for? Effectively, you can take mm -hmm. SignalR and make it serverless. So okay. um, our our mutual friend Anthony has done a great amount of work on these things. If I can find them in here, the uh, bindings. So if I can find the SignalR service bindings for Azure Functions, yeah. these are bindings that you can use from your Node.js app excuse me, your Node.js function or from your .NET function. Yeah. And what effectively happens is whenever I call a function, I want that function to drop a message into the SignalR service sure. that all of my clients can kind of respond to if I want, if I want them to. Yeah. Um, the really exciting thing about his bindings is that you don't need .NET anywhere. So you mean I don't need a hub? You or don't I don't need an ASP.NET app or anything like Nothing. that. Nothing. You don't need any ASP.NET. But I can still communicate real time with like my various connected clients. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. So we have another thing that I've kind of worked on uh, with Anthony on the side. Um, it's a tiny little, uh, tiny little app here. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of open it up. And what you'll see is in my VS Code window, I've got a uh, function JavaScript, a function .NET. Uh, and we're going to look at the function uh, JavaScript. And what, what we have to do today is you'll see that I have negotiate. Mm -hmm. Negotiate is a uh, like a reserved URL in SignalR speak. You heard me talk about yeah. transport negotiation mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, today, we want to make this a little bit more transparent and better for you. We're working okay. with the functions team on this. But you would have to actually create, if you were doing this in Node, you would actually have to create your own you know, negotiate guy right. and, or, or function. And what this will do is it literally hands you back the connection info for your client to be able to reach out and talk to the signal service on the back end. Um, so I'm guessing that's like connection strings, tokens, like things of that it's nature. Not even, it's not even that. It's literally the, the URL and the connection string to your signal or service. Oh, okay. So I could actually put that in something like uh, Android code, which I've got right here because our good friend Mikhail on the team has done a wonderful job at working on an official uh, Java client, managed Java client for the uh, first signal R. So right here you'll see that I've got a URL and this is a URL of my function yeah. and all this app is going to do is connect to that function, establish an uh, actual connection and then I'm going to call that function from somewhere else. Right. And that function will trigger. When it triggers it'll take a payload and it'll drop pieces of that payload on the signal R service that will then come over to this Java app. And notice I didn't use any .NET robots anywhere. There's yeah. no .NET anywhere in this equation. So what I'll do first is great little feature of uh, VS Code. I want to go ahead and do Control Shift P, and you'll see that I have this word emulator here. That's because oh. it actually gives me the ability to run my Android emulators directly from within. You can do it in code. VS Code. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's I pretty cool. It's pretty cool, right? Okay. I don't know if you can actually build Android apps in VS Code and deploy them and all that, but yeah. if you already have your emulators on your machine and it's already set up, it'll, it'll, it'll pull it yeah. in and run it. So that's pretty cool. So I've already got this guy built. Notice I'm not debugging. This is you know pre-compiled app. So I've got this app here called Pull Request R. 
course, we have to call sure, it something with an R. Signal R naming convention, exactly, right? Exactly. Totally is. So I've got the pull requester guy right here. And what he's doing is he is listening uh, for a function uh, that I've got right here at pullrequester.azurewebsites.net. Okay. So what I've got is a very simple, empty, pretty much uh, repository here. And the idea behind this, this repo is it's actually going to, whenever I do a pull request or any activity related to a pull request, mm -hmm. it's going to send a, a webhook yeah. over to my Azure function. Now that Azure function lives right here. And whenever the function runs, all it, all it does is it literally just grabs grabs the method and pops it back onto the, the signal or service. Sure. Got um, it. So if I were to go over here real quickly and just say, get, go into the readme, MD, hit edit real quick, and we'll say uh, So you're going to make some change in GitHub, and then you can commit it. Exactly. That'll so. cause the webhook to fire, yep. and then that will trigger your function. Exactly. So I'll do this right here, and I'll say Brady Gaster changes, changes, and I'll hit Propose file change, and immediately that's going to send a pull request over. I'll hit create. Now let me do this. Uh oh, our app broke. Of course that would happen. So I've got the app running here, and if I were to go right here and say create pull request, there we go. Oh wow, awesome! So it's already come in. So that was right. GitHub sending my function uh, uh, HTTP request. My function turning around, dropping that some components of that onto the SignalR service, right. and then the SignalR service popping a message off to my Android client. Notice I said no.NET anywhere in there. Right. I think That's what's really crazy. cool about this demo is that you know obviously like a lot of .NET folks know about SignalR, yep. Yep. but like now we're showing SignalR like to everybody, right? Exactly. Like, we're seeing it in JavaScript. Exactly. We're seeing it in Java. Exactly. So it doesn't doesn't matter what the exactly. client is. Like we could use web sockets or whatever to talk to it. Exactly. And work with the service. Exactly. And while I'm thinking about it, pardon me. No, started running probably from driving around cold all day. <laughs> uh, so if I do SignalR Hub protocol specification, do a quick little search for it. Here we go. And this is actually the Hub protocol. It's right on GitHub. Okay. So this is like a part of our code. We actually ship this with code, and we, sure. we keep it pretty pretty regularly. And it's updated. versioned and all that type of stuff. Yep. Yep. Got it. And we recently added message pack support. So we have uh, previously it was only JSON. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that people complained about a lot early on in SignalR was there was a hard requirement on jQuery that's right. gone. You don't have to do that anymore. Okay. No more uh, jQuery. It's all it's all native JavaScript since the ASP.NET mm -hmm. Core era started. Um, and what this guy will do is it this document will do is it'll literally walk you through. If you wanted to build a client, um, I've, I'm, I'm looking at you, David Justice. I would love to have you write a Go client. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a lot of other people out there that would like to have Python, Go, sure. et cetera, et cetera. Let's real Rust, time. Whatever. Rust, Rust, that's another one my buddy Justice is into. So if you're interested, feel free to, you know, jump in here and, you know, learn how to build your own signal or client. Um, Great, that's awesome. The last thing I'll show you is this super secret uh, feature we've got. It's not really super secret anymore. Uh, and you'll see the URL that I've got here called Streamer. I love your design skills in this. This is amazing. Oh, this is amazing. This isn't mine. <laughs> this, is, this is a wonderful dev on the team. Did a great job with this demo. Okay. Uh, we don't have the code for it out yet. We're still doing some code review, sure. aka teasing him. Uh, he did much better than I could have ever done. But we introduced streaming in ASP.NET Core SignalR, and that's the ability to stream from the server to the client. Yeah. So you can actually use like the new built-in channels and pipelines mm. and just stream data very fast. With our new 3.0 preview feature was to add this concept of client to server streaming. Okay. So in client to server streaming, rather than just like pumping data out from the server side, we can actually pump data in from the client. And I want you to try this on your machine. Okay. So I'm on screen, okay. and Cecil's on his computer, and we're both on streamer.azurewebsites.net. Streamer.azurewebsites.net, mm -hmm. got it. And he's just going to enter in his name or say live from channel 9 or All something. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to type in Cecil here Cecil, real quick. He's going to say start streaming. Start streaming. And he's starting the stream. And what's going to happen is, since he's streaming, of course, it's not going to show up on my screen now. Oh. Random stream. Cecil, enter. Start yeah. streaming. Start streaming. Okay, now, now here's Cecil. You can see that as soon as he started streaming, you see that his name popped in here. Yeah. And I can click watch stream. And oh, what's cool. What's actually happening here? Cecil waves. Oh, that's cool. And that neat. So it's, what, it's almost like instantaneous. Like that's crazy. Totally instantaneous. So what's happening? And this is wow. the even cool part. Now, oh, if buddy. you scroll, you can't see it because you're, you're streaming. Yeah. But let's go ahead and stop yours. So stop your stream real sure, quick. Sure, I'll stop my stream. Stop yours, and I'll do one now. I'll do Brady G. I'd start streaming. Okay, so no, what's happening now is that your name has just popped up on my screen, and I can hit watch your stream. Yep. Right, and I'm looking at you right now. Yes, he's looking at me. So I can wave. Very cool. And now, if I scroll down here, you'll see here's the video 
being captured. You don't see it. Actually, you might see it over there. You see you. Yeah, of it. yeah. Um, uh, But what I see right here is an image, and what's happening is the camera is actually taking frame by frame image, mm -hmm. and then it's converting each frame into ASCII, and this is the best part, sending that ASCII to the server side, and then SignalR is pumping that ASCII back out. So what you're seeing rendering on my screen is coming from the server at the same time it's coming from the server on your screen. So all the image manipulation is happening in the browser, yeah. and then it goes to the server? It's ASCII. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? Um, it's Brennan Conroy, amazing dev nice. on the team. That's awesome. Great job. Um, we'll have the code for this sometime soon. We still have a couple code reviews to do on it. Got it. We just want to make sure that we're not showing you some bad habits. Of course. So, uh, you know, sure. samples. With Proper security samples. reviews and all of that type of stuff. All that. You, got, you have to let Barry look at it. So yeah, know. I hear Barry's pretty scary in my life. He's 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 not scary. He's he's, no? he's just intimidating. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Have you had him on the show yet? I have not. I need to give him a call and get him to come we on. We should do this. We should definitely get Blood R on the show. We'll talk about it when we get off. Yeah, we we'll get him on here. Um, so really, that's kind of our quick lap around Signal R and kind of where we are with the ASP.NET Core Signal R and awesome, the man. functions and serverless and all the good stuff. I kind of hoped Anthony would pop in and surprise us with some new demos. I know, but like he, he had some other stuff, stuff to do, so okay. we'll get him on the next time. That makes sense. He knows how to drive in snow. He should. He lives in Vancouver, right? Exactly. So you should know that, that stuff yeah, works. Right, yeah. So one last question, sure. really quick before we go. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about some of the new stuff that's coming in SignalR, what's SignalR good for. Mm -hmm. What do we talk about, or really quickly, what is, should we not do with SignalR? Like when is, not, <sighs> when is it not a good use case This is for great. This? this is great. Because we have tons of messaging things, We have right? tons of messaging things. Okay, so let me be very clear here. SignalR is, it started as PubSub real-time. Like yes. it was PubSub plus real-time, or it was real-time and people used it as PubSub. Mm -hmm. You pick your poison. Uh, things like event grid, event hubs. Uh, service bus. Dur service bus, durable yeah. functions. All those things serve a very like important role mm -hmm. in your distributed architecture. What the, the role that SignalR plays is really that real-time thing. It's like keeping your users engaged. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for your enterprise message pumps. It's not yeah. that, okay? Uh, you could wrap some logic around your SignalR hubs on the client and the server we're actually talking about writing a doc on this right now, mm -hmm. uh, where you literally kind of build your own ACK. Uh, experience. Sure. So, yeah. you know, on the client, I would count each message I send and make sure that they're processed sequentially. And if not, I know something blew up. Yeah. Okay. But the kind of the joke that I tell people is, SignalR is not the thing you want to use for collecting your shopping cart orders and transmitting them to the database. Because yeah. you'll drop one out of a thousand messages. I, I don't know what the exact number is. It just depends sure. on your pipe. Um, between SignalR one and SignalR two, we we made some improvements to make the performance a lot better. Mm -hmm. Such as we uh, we disabled automatic reconnection. Mm -hmm. We're actually talking about adding that back in with a couple of different options, okay. like um, you know like an intelligent back off or you know get you know you telling me how many times you want to try to connect. Yeah. We're going to add some of that back in, mm -hmm. uh, but then we had some features that we did like we would try to repump the messages that you'd missed while you were disconnected. Yeah. That was not that wasn't not nice. a good idea. So we're not going to do that again. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't ask. Never going to do that again. <laughs> okay. uh, it was bad. Um, Damien and David will say that that was bad. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on them. They actually told me. So uh, sure what I would say, David and Damien are the guys that created SignalR and .NET Core and everything else uh, that we know and love. Um, but what I would say is that SignalR is not really for durable enterprise pub sub. Now, you would use Azure Functions for your durable enterprise pub sub and to inform you when things are happening and the steps in the process, you would yeah. pump messages into the signal service and have a client listening for it. Sure. So you just each thing has its piece. Like you said, like we have service bus, we have a lot of these other messaging services. Exactly. Each within their own special traits and, and use cases that we exactly. could use for, for those type of scenarios. Exactly. As well. Exactly. Um, and, and the only other scenario that I would say a lot of people have had mixed results. Uh, and it's not a problem with SignalR, it's, it's a problem with space time, and that is using SignalR anything in uh, mobile capacity because okay. you, you go out of zone, you know, you, you're sure. not going to be connected. So sure. scenarios like that. Uh, when people look at SignalR, the immediate response is, I want to replace all my REST APIs with this. Sure. I want to replace all my PubSub with this. It, I, I would really as the PM of the product, I would love for you to do that, but I wouldn't feel responsible if you did. Yeah, you I, know? Got it. Um, I got so it. Like it's not the be all end all messaging framework <laughs> right. for all things on the web. Right, but I'm still young. We have time. We things could, might happen. We could do this. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, yeah, okay. we could definitely do this. Got uh, it. We could, we could, we could do more with Sigmar. Let's put it that way. Awesome. Yeah, you know, we have awesome. plans. So yeah. Cool, cool man. Well, hey, Brady, thank you so much for coming Thanks on, for man. Like, Thanks a lot. I really wanted to have you on the show. I'm super excited that you're here. I'm glad to be here. I was glad to be here. Sure. Now I have to meet with Scott. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> So thank so. you all for watching the show, man. This was another episode of the On.NET Show, and we had Brady coming on, letting us know about some of the really cool features that are coming on in ASP.NET Core SignalR.